Tonight, our economy is the strongest in the world. The president is touting a strong economy ahead of his trip to France for a highly anticipated meeting of the G7. If our friends would adopt some of the pro-growth policies that we have adopted, their growth would improve markedly. Amid fears of a global slowdown in the economy, the U.S. deficit is breaking record highs. Both parties want to play Santa Claus. With neither party willing to rein in spending. At some point, we risk everything. The threats to the American power grid and what we can do to protect it. All this and more tonight on Fake Nation. Welcome to Faith Nation. I'm John Jessup. And I'm Jenna Browder. Will there be fireworks in France? Tonight, President Trump is off to the G7 summit, meeting with other world leaders. These leaders represent the world's seven largest economies and convene as whispers of a possible global recession grow louder. CBN White House correspondent Ben Kennedy joins us now. Ben, it sounds like the president's first meeting could be a bit friendlier. Yeah, Jenna, John, you're right. President Trump will hold his first meeting with new British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. The two are expected to talk trade and Britain's efforts to leave the European Union. He'll also hold individual meetings with leaders of Canada, France, India, Germany, and Japan. And as Jenna was mentioning earlier, it could be during his sit-down with French President Emmanuel Macron, we could see some fireworks after President Trump has voiced frustration with them over their digital services tax, which does affect large U.S. tech companies. The commander-in-chief has even threatened to retaliate with tariffs on French wines. John, Jenna. Thank you, Ben. Well, joining us now is Stan Voiger, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Stan, thank you so much for being with us. For sure. Thank Stan, uh, we know these leading economies meet annually. What's different this year? Well, what is different this year, I think, first and foremost, is that there is a strong difference of opinion on many aspects of sort of the rules-based international economic order between President Trump on the one hand and many of the other leaders uh, on the other hand. Secondly, um, there is discussion ongoing, and President Trump has, has shown support for this, to bring Russia back into the fold mm -hmm. of the G7. It was a uh, member from the early 90s on until the annexation of Crimea in, in 2014, when it was expelled because it uh, invaded and uh, annexed Crimea. Is there much appetite for that? Well, the pre uh, French President Macron has, has shown some enthusiasm, and it's not entirely clear um, what the point is of having Russia rejoin the G7, but in fairness, it's not entirely clear what the point is of the of the G7 either. So it's you know, in some sense, it's a it's a reasonable fit. It was originally a forum really for the leading market economies to right. to, to discuss economic affairs, um, but that was in the context of the Cold War, when obviously there was a clear political counterpart to that. Uh, that's much less the case now. Uh, Stan, Politico described this as Trump's nightmare G7, really describing him as an isolated world leader. And we all remember this photo, if we can bring it up, from the last G7 summit. Uh, does Trump have any friends at this summit? Well, arguably, the new British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, is, is his friend uh, to the extent that, that such things exist between uh, leaders of, uh, of different countries. Um, Boris Johnson has been relatively positive about, about uh, President Trump. He has really abstained from, uh, from the kind of criticism of President Trump that we've heard from, from other world leaders. And he is very much counting on President Trump's support in securing a new trade relationship between the U.S. and the U.K. after the United Kingdom uh, leaves the European Union uh, as planned in late October. Stan, usually there's a joint agreement that's made at the end of each of these summits. Interestingly, there's no joint uh, that's agreement right. this year. Last year uh, at this meeting, um, the joint agreement did not feature the usual praise for, for free trade and, you know, the WTO and institutions like that. Uh, and so Pre President Macron, in order to avoid uh, another uh, lack of consensus like that, has decided to do away with the, uh, the joint declaration uh, in its entirety. Uh, yeah. China just imposed another $75 billion tariff on U.S. goods. Uh, any end in sight in this ongoing trade war, Stan? Well, so this, uh, these new tariffs are in response to tariffs that uh, the, the U.S. has imposed on, on many 
Chinese imports. The U.S. has also announced uh, tariffs on all remaining Chinese imports, practically, that will kick in in September and December. And so it's, ju it's another step in this escalating uh, trade conflict between the U.S. and China, where we're almost at the point where all imports and exports be going between the U.S. and China are subject to tariffs of at least 10 percent. Sam, as an expert in this, what do you think is the big news that will come out of the summit? Well, I, I am worried that we will see further escalation of trade, relationship between, trade relationships between Europe and the, uh, and the U.S. You, um, in the intro, uh, there was mention of uh, France's digital services tax. The U.K. is imposing one, too. So is Spain. Um, the U.S. at the same time has been threatening to impose tariffs on cars and car parts coming in from Europe, which is a major, major trade flow. And so you could see a situation where you get the same sort of escalatory dynamic that we see between the U.S. and China. I think that would harm both uh, the European economies and the U.S. economy at a time where, you know, there is some fragility in, in, in the performance of those economies. All right. Well, Stan Voyer, Voyer thank you so much for being with for us sure. today. Thank you Thanks, for having Stan. me. Well, President Trump is doubling down after two hard blows hit the economy this week that have Democrats smelling blood. But who is to blame for the economic shifting sands? Jennifer Wishon has that story. As talk of recession fills the hot air here in Washington, the Trump administration is pushing back with its own message of confidence. Speaking to reporters outside the White House, the president's chief economic advisor offering assurances. The tea leaves the administration is reading predict a strong future economy. Folks are working, they're spending, uh, and they're saving, which is terrific. And there's no end, to me, there's no end in sight. If anyone is at fault, the president says it's the Fed for not lowering interest rates. I think I could be helped out by the Fed. But the Fed doesn't like helping me too much. The administration is floating solutions, including more tax cuts. We have for a while been looking at something I call Tax Cuts 2.0, which will be a compilation of our best thinking on additional tax relief incentives for the uh, middle class, for blue collar workers, small businesses and so forth. The administration is in repair mode after taking two blows this week. First, the Congressional Budget Office predicted the federal deficit will exceed one trillion by 2020. Both parties want to play Santa Claus. They spend too much money. The most, most important thing, though, to get the deficit down is to keep the economy booming. And, you know, we've had two solid years of economic growth. Then the Bureau of Labor Statistics revised its numbers to reveal the economy created half a million fewer jobs than originally reported. Still, Moore says the real problem isn't jobs, rather too few workers. You know, the uh, seven and a half million surplus jobs when there's six million unemployed means we have a million and a half you know, more jobs than even people looking for jobs. Still, the economic news has Democrats seeking the nomination for president smelling blood. On the stump, frontrunner Joe Biden blamed signs of a slowing economy on the president's trade war with China. Democrats know a weak economy could give them a major edge in 2020. This is a new AP poll shows strong disapproval of the president's performance across the board. But the one area people approve of most is his handling of the economy. The president is off to France for the G7 summit, and where the economy is concerned, he'll encourage his allies to be more like the U.S. If our friends would adopt some of the pro-growth policies that we have adopted, their growth would improve markedly. And at the president's urging, G7 leaders will meet tomorrow morning to discuss the economy and trade. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Thank you, Jennifer. And here with us now are Hannah Trudeau, politics reporter for The Daily Beast, and CBN News chief political analyst David Brody. Thank you both for being with us Thanks, today. Guys. Hannah, let's start off with you. This week, um, actually today, rather, the third <laughs> Democrat just dropped out of the race, Seth Moulton, and he issued a warning saying the party is moving too far to the left. Yes, he did. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I think Seth Moulton is just one of a few moderate Democrats who have dropped out recently. We saw um, former Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper drop out, pursuing a Senate run, uh, Seth Moulton, and Jay Inslee, who is, is more progressive but is moderate on some issues. So I think um, what we're seeing is so far those lower tier moderates are not faring so well. Of course, um, that's, that's in contrast to former Vice Pres President Joe Biden, right. who is more moderate, who is a 
course, at the top of the polls. So, but he's kind of, you know, he has some competition from somebody like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders for that progressive lane. Uh, do you think Elizabeth Warren can kind of edge Biden now? She is in number two now. She's doing really well, and I think she has the momentum. I mean, she has more momentum that we've seen from her so far than Bernie Sanders, who came in with a significant advantage. He had the groundwork from, from last time that he ran. He had, you know, a strong organizational uh, backing for, for his campaign this time around. But I think we see uh, Elizabeth Warren kind of edging out Biden and, and some other candidates in a lot of those early states, in particular Iowa, where she's built up this huge apparatus of of grassroots supporters. And I, real quick, if I could just add on to that, I have a feeling that when the field narrows, you're going to even see more of a distinction or at least a more of a comparison directly between Biden and Warren. And that's when I think it's going to even get worse for Joe Biden because Elizabeth Warren has really done, as Hannah was saying, some of the best uh, uh, putting it all together from what, kind of like an economic patriotism standpoint. Uh, the AP has a new poll that shows Trump's approval rating falling, especially among women, uh, his disapproval rating at 65 percent. David, with the economy as strong as it is, he should be polling much higher. Well, yeah, but he doesn't want to talk about the economy, John, because yeah, it's right. boring, he says. <laughs> he says it's boring. He's not disciplined. He's just not disciplined at all. Look, he's an incumbent who has a strong, at least for now, a strong economy. It should be a slam dunk, but he won't do it. He doesn't like to do it. And why? Because he has said it rallies. It is boring. People don't want to hear about that. They want to hear about Colin Kaepernick and all the cultural stuff. That's what he's good. He's good at pushing people's buttons. Here's the other problem. The economy could start to not necessarily tank, but as we've talked about, get slower and slower and not be as roaring as now. And that's another problem that's on the horizon for it's this president. It's almost like you read my mind. It's a great segue. So, Thank Hannah. You. We've been working together way too <laughs> I know, long. We worked uh, way too long. <laughs> the economy is going to be a huge issue in 2020, we all know. But as David was just signaling, with the economy showing signs of potentially slowing down, does this potentially give Democrats an opening? I think it does, because um, I haven't yet heard a Democrat say that they're hoping for the economy to, to tank, obviously, because we're all Americans in the country. Um, but that being said, I think that if it does start to tank, um, we've already seen some candidates, Elizabeth Warren, who we were just talking about, she's she's come out with a plan um, predicting a recession uh, in, in the upcoming years. So we're seeing candidates start to plan ahead, um, if that were to be the case. And I think, you know, certainly it's a, it's a point of contrast that they can make from, from President Trump, if nothing else. Uh, shifting gears here a little bit, uh, this afternoon we learned that uh, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has been treated for a malignant tumor on her pancreas. Uh, you know, David, she's 86 years old. She's had a history of serious health mm -hmm. problems, but she is not stepping down. What does this say about the political times we're living in? Well, let's be clear, and I've had a lot of uh, issues uh, in my family with pancreatic cancer. This is the worst type of cancer, most likely, really, that you can get. So this is not good for her at all. Uh, what it means politically is that if Brett Kavanaugh, if we thought that was a fight, that's the little leagues compared mm. to this one, because this will be a replacement at some point. I'm, I, I hate to get ahead of the game, but you're asking the political question. At some point, it will be a replacement with a female, a woman, and in the hashtag Me Too movement, I mean, there's going to be, it's going to be all on steroids for that, plus the fact that, let's be honest, John Roberts is now the swing vote on the Supreme Court. So even though it's 5-4, Roberts is kind of like that Anthony Kennedy vote. So therefore, this will really, truly be more of a, of a possible big-time majority uh, for the conservatives because of John Roberts being a bit spotty. You're talking about a real shift in the balance of the power big of the time. court. Big time. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you both Hannah and David for being with us today. We Thank appreciate you. your insights. Thank you. Thanks. When we come back, on the brink of disaster, why our power grid is open to threats and what we can do to fix it. Introducing the CBN Bible from CBN.com. Now, an easier way to study the Bible and grow in your faith. I like your favorite verse. Read separate versions at a glance. Click and read a commentary. Or cross-reference your favorite verse using the Strong's Concordance. All the right tools to study the Bible. All in one place. The CBN Bible. Available at cbn.com Bible or the iTunes App Store. It has the power to influence weight loss, boost your immune system, and improve brain function. We've seen an explosion of data on the role of the gut microbiome in health. The free Build a Better Gut booklet reveals the latest information about the gut microbiome, 
you'll discover how your gut affects the rest of your health. The gut microbiome has been linked to depression and cancer and heart disease. Learn how to build a stronger, healthier gut. The microbiome, if it's in good composition, are really protecting us all the time from more invasive things. Get the Build a Better Gut booklet, free from the Christian Broadcasting Network. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com slash build a better gut. You need to make sure that your microbes are working with you, not against you. And if you order online, you'll get immediate access to the Build a Better Gut series, a digital copy of the booklet, and related bonus material. Build a Better Gut today. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com slash build a better gut for your free copy. Here, we're committed to a heritage of rigorous scholarship dating back over a thousand years. And to a faith tradition dating back a thousand more. This is how we create a culture of inquiry where no topic is off limits. And a culture of hope. Anything's possible! It's Christian leadership. And it's changing the world for the better. It's higher learning. It's greater knowing. It's what makes us whole. It's what makes us region. Tonight, experts say we could be on the brink of a catastrophic disaster. And CBN News National, Secu National Security Correspondent Eric Phillips has more on the risk we face of our electric power grid being disrupted by any uh, number of factors. Eric? Yeah, Jenna and John, I want you to stop and think for one moment about how much we depend on electricity in our everyday lives. Talking about lights, water, gas pumps, ATMs, medical equipment, and really the list just goes on and on. But now think about the nation's power grid that supplies that electricity being damaged or disabled for weeks, months, or even up to a year. It's a very real possibility. And experts say it can happen several different ways. We risk everything. Frank Gaffney heads the Center for Security Policy in Washington, D.C. He's on the front lines of sounding the alarm about the vulnerability of the nation's electric grid. Our electric infrastructure is very susceptible. One of those dangers is what's known as an EMP or electromagnetic pulse, which can happen if an adversary detonates a nuclear weapon in space, causing a burst of radiation that won't hurt people, but would fry our electric grid. The same thing could happen naturally in the event of a solar storm. Then there's another naturally occurring process deep within the Earth that could result in what's known as a magnetic pole reversal. Dr. Hugh Ross talked about it on a recent edition of the 700 Club. The biggest consequence is the damage it could do to our electric power grids. What can we do? Gaffney says there are several effective steps the military took to protect sensitive assets some 30 years ago after discovering these vulnerabilities. What are called surge protectors, sort of think of what you hopefully have your computer plugged into, only bigger. Um, shunts, which essentially move electric current around what you're trying to protect and Faraday cages. And it turns out that, while we may not know it, almost all of us now have a Faraday cage in our homes. It's called a microwave oven. These protective measures would cost billions of dollars, and at least one organization questions the need. The Electric Power Research Institute, or EPRI, is an independent nonprofit. In a recent report, it said while protecting the grid would be helpful, even without it, quote, possible damage to large power transformers was found to be minimal. Gaffney is critical of the report, saying EPRI is closely aligned with the electric utilities. He says their findings clash sharply with those of a federal commission that studied the problem. And its chairman estimated that if the lights were to go out and stay out for a year or more, Nine out of ten of us would die. Gaffney warns those stakes are too high to take chances. Even if no enemy used either what's called EMP or sabotage or cyber attacks to take down our grid with catastrophic consequences for our country and our people, Mother Nature is going to do it. There is an ongoing debate over who would pay for the upgrades to our power grid, whether it would be utility companies, the government, or some combination of big business and federal dollars. Now, I should mention that I reached out to EPRI for an interview, and they declined my request. John and Jenna. Thank you, Eric. 
Well, coming up, why taxpayer dollars are paying for human tissue from aborted babies to be used in animals. That story next. Life. It's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it. I came to give you life. Life to the fullest. Life in your family. Life in your finances. Life in your body, mind, and spirit. Life in your everyday. At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover life. Life. Live it fully. CBN.com. Want to be a part of a community that inspires your spiritual growth while winning prizes? The all-new MyCBN app. Connect with the community for prayer and encouragement. Track and set spiritual goals. Enjoy conversation starters with friends and family. And collect points to win prizes. The all-new MyCBN app. A great place to belong. Download the app at cbn.com slash mobile. Grow. Connect. Have fun. The all-new MyCBN app. Watch breaking news, in-depth exclusive stories and programs from health to entertainment you won't find anywhere else. The CBN News Channel, a perspective you can trust. Enjoy credible news reporting from around the world. Discover inspiring programs and stories of hope all in one place from a Christian perspective. The CBN News Channel, a perspective you can trust. Check your local listings or visit cbnnewschannel.com. Come home to the sounds of Southern Gospel from CBN Radio. You'll enjoy a rich Southern blend of bluegrass, classic gospel, and Southern Gospel favorites like the Gaithers, the Crab Family, and bluegrass sounds like Mountain Faith. So make yourself at home with the all-new CBN Southern Gospel, now available at CBNRadio.com. Tissues and organs from aborted babies are being transplanted into animals in the name of research, and you are paying for it. A number of colleges and universities, including Harvard, are conducting tests using millions of tax-funded grants from the National Institutes of Health. In one study, the reproductive tracts were removed from a pair of aborted twins, then implanted into mice. Well, joining us now uh, is White Coast uh, is John Goodman of the White Coast White Coat. I'll get it. Uh, White, Coat, <laughs> White Coat Waste Project, a watchdog group exposing costly and wasteful government-funded experiments on animals. Uh, and you guys called this to our attention, so thank you so much for um, being here, and thank you for calling it to our attention. I guess most people would just start off and ask why. What's the purpose? So this is primarily for basic biomedical research. And uh, as CBN's covered extensively, the Trump administration has really made a priority of uh, cutting funding for taxpayer-funded fetal tissue research that involves taking tissues from elective abortions, taking bones from aborted babies, injecting them into animals, then injecting them into other animals for wasteful experiments that aren't helping anyone and that are opposed by our majority of Americans, whether they're animal lovers, pro-lifers, liberty lovers, uh, across the board. What kind of experiments, though? Uh, these are uh, health experiments. So looking at when they, they're basically trying to humanize other animals hmm. and make them more like human beings. But that's as ridiculous as it sounds. You can't make a, a mouse more like a human being. And we see that there's all types of alternatives that are being developed and that exist already that are more relevant to humans, that are more cost effective and less controversial. How did you find out this was happening? So we've been doing an analysis of National Institutes of Health grants and have found that uh, about $120 million last year was spent by the federal government, our tax dollars, on human fetal tissue research at institutions in 33 different states across the country. So this is not just a problem at Harvard on the coastal states and UCSF, this is a problem across the country. What's been the reaction on Capitol Hill? Uh, outrage, really. Uh, members of Congress are circulating a letter right now to the NIH uh, that they're going to be sending about this issue, and people want to know how they can get involved. And uh, this is, again, this is a bipartisan issue. Uh, people across the, the political spectrum are concerned about what the government is doing, how it's wasting our money, uh, and how it's harming uh, fetuses and animals. Justin, one more time. I think you may have hinted at it, but how long has this been going on? And again, just for emphasis, how much is this costing taxpayers? So this has been going on for decades. Last year, it cost taxpayers $120 million. And there have been some restrictions put in place, but the overwhelming majority of it has continued and will unless Congress takes action. And why, don't, why aren't we hearing more about this? Uh, 
That's a good question. <laughs> I think there's so many issues competing for the public's attention right now, uh, but certainly uh, in a lot of conservative media, the issue of human fetal, t human fetal tissue research has been uh, a headline for many months. All right, Justin Goodman with White Coat. I got this on White Coat Waste Project. Thank you so much for being with Thanks us today. Thank us. you. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate it. When we come back, a new look at the paintings of Europe's old masters and how one museum is sharing their biblical stories through these historic works of art. Life. It's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it. I came to give you life. Life to the fullest. Life in your family. Life in your finances. Life in your body, mind, and spirit. Life in your every day. At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover life. Life. Live it fully. CBN.com. On October 1st, 1961, history was made when a tiny station began transmitting the first signals of the Christian Broadcasting Network. CBN, the Christian Broadcasting Network. And now, a new era has begun with the all new CBN News Channel. Just moments ago, the Iron Dome intercepted an incoming rocket right on the Gaza border. And ministering in this area, spiritual warfare is definitely involved. A 24-7 news network bringing you the news you want from a source you can trust. In Kenya, 40% of the medical services are actually provided by these Christian hospitals. Let's talk about the economy. Believers here are joining together to win people to Jesus Christ. All your favorite shows now in one place. Go to CBNNewsChannel.com to find out how to get the CBN News Channel on your TV all day, every day. CBN News. Finally tonight, some of the great works of art history are coming to life right here in Washington at the Museum of the Bible. The new exhibit gives visitors a plain view of the paintings of the European old masters like Tintoretto, Dolce, and Murillo. The exhibit, open to the public through the end of September 2020, shows how various Christian symbols repeat across time, from the Madonna and Child, to the robes of John the Baptist, to the hands of Christ. The works of the old masters date back to the 1400s, when paintings were largely used to help those who couldn't read learn the biblical story. Those are beautiful works of art, and I think uh, it gives us an opportunity or another excuse to head right back over to the yeah, Museum of the Bible. Yeah, it's a great place. And special thanks to Patrick Robertson, the photojournalist who uh, went over there and snapped some sh uh, photos today. He's got a decent eye. Yeah, he does. Well, that's going to do it for tonight's Faith Nation. Have a great weekend.